Well, hello and welcome back to Principles of Accounting One. I'm your host, Dr. B. We are about to discuss the concept of receivables. Uh, that would be accounts receivable, notes receivable, bonds receivable, um, anything receivable, which means uh, how do we account for what the business is receiving from customers or from things that we sold or things along those lines. Before we jump into the discussion on receivables, I want to uh, call your attention to the classroom and talk about where we are. Uh, we just finished week four. <laughs> week four uh, felt like a real long week because it was. There was a lot that you had to do last week, uh, so I, I appreciate most of you sticking through it. <laughs> I know it was a challenging week for most of you. Uh it, week, four, week four was a very challenging week. You had your uh, weeks, uh, chapter seven quiz, week eight discussion board uh, in the midterm exam. So yeah, that was a lot of stuff you did. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, I I want to say want to say thank you for uh, for your hard work last week. I know it was a challenge. Uh, I know that midterm exam was uh, the midterm exam was a little brutal uh, for for some of you. Uh, which, um, you know, the, the exams are not easy. You know, this, uh, midterm exam, final exam, not easy. Uh, the midterm exam was definitely not easy. Um, there were a, f a, f a few A's that's, that's nice. There were a lot of B's, a lot of C's, a couple not so great ones. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it was a hard exam. I know that. I know that it was. The, the midterm exam was absolutely brutal. Uh, not easy at all. Um, uh, yeah, I know. I know it was. And no, there's no second chances on the midterm exam. I'm sorry. But I have some good news. Um, if you uh, would like, and this is totally up to you, okay, uh, it has to be done within the next two days, so by February 9th, uh, I have an opportunity for a couple bonus points, a uh, total of five bonus points for the course. Oh, that's nice, right? That's 5% of the grade. So if you did not do well on the midterm exam or if you want to earn five extra points, here is an opportunity for you. Uh, it's called the Mid-Semester Survey. It says bonus points right there in the name, yeah? So Mid-Semester Survey, it's open and available for you to take. Uh, if you take the mid-semester survey, you will earn five extra bonus points. Okay. Thank you, Professor. You're I'm already taking it. it. I'm already <laughs> taking it. Yes. Yay. Thanks, Miss Evans. Thank I'm you, sorry. Professor, too, because I did take process. that already. You took it, too? Great. I'm yeah, so happy. Yeah, because before, my grade was an A, and after the midterm, my grade came to a C+. Plus. <laughs> yes, so. the midterm exam was brutal, I know. Yes. I actually took the survey as well, Professor. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I took it, too. You took it but as well? Great, great. Grade. I cannot see my grade. Yeah, well, a lot, I, I, have not, I have not yet closed the survey. It's open until the 9th. So oh, I, no, I, about, like, the other... Maybe because, like, I did them late? Uh, I don't know. You should be able to see them. But um, just double check and let me know. If, if you're still having okay. a problem, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, help you out. Okay, thank you. So, so, uh, so yeah, if you did not do well on the midterm exam, uh, there's an opportunity for five extra bonus points if you complete the mid-semester survey. So uh, a lot of you have already done it. So yay, thank you so much. Uh, I, again, it, it helps me, it helps you, uh, it helps both of us. So please, uh, if you have the opportunity, even if you don't want the extra bonus points, please uh, complete the mid-semester survey. Um, it really does help me and it helps you. The reason why is because the mid-semester survey, which is found under uh, week four, by the way, uh, it's five questions, and it's just a... Uh, it's short answer, right? I'm looking for your transparency, your honesty. Um, if you answer these questions, it helps me and it helps you. 
because uh, I like to know how I'm doing halfway through the course, just as much as you want to know how well you're doing halfway through the course. And, you know, this provides us the opportunity to, to pivot if we, if we need to, yeah? So that's why it's so important. Uh, uh, Dominique, please, see your hand raised. Just need to, uh, there you go. So I was going to, uh, so I was curious, um, because I noticed something about uh, the midterm. So I had answered this question, and actually I think it was two of them, and I could send it over to you if you would like to see. But it said, like, it gave an explanation. I guess they're saying that I got it wrong, but I guess I actually got it right. So, like, I get, well, I did get it right. So my question is, did they give the facts for the ones to get right, or are the ones to get wrong the ones without the feedback? Because I thought the ones that you got wrong were the ones with the feedback. But the feedback they gave me, I'm I'm sorry, Dominique. You, you, uh, for some reason, your microphone got real light, and I couldn't hear the the last part of your question. My bad. Well, basically, um, the feedback that they gave me for when I guess I got wrong was the answer that I put. So I'm asking back for the wrong answer. Wait, uh, which question was that? Do you remember? Yeah. So. Um, I took a picture of it. So it was the one that was like a company reported net income and the answer was 36%. And then I put a, but it said feedback and it, you know, showed you how to do the problem and it said the answer, but it said that's the one I got wrong. So I was asking is that the feedback for when you get it wrong or was that just telling me what I already know? Like, I'm kind of confused. Oh, sure. Okay. So, so, uh, and, and I did find that the question you're talking about in this question six, uh, 36% is the correct answer here. So it says company reported, uh, net income of $6,480 for the month of October. It's net sales for October were 18,000. What is the profit margin? So, so we know that the profit margin formula is net income divided by net sales. So net income 6480 divided by net sales, 18,000 equals 0 0.36, so 36%. Um, it shows the feedback for both the correct and incorrect uh, answers, which is simply the formula and, and, and the numbers plugged into the formula. The reason why it shows uh, the feedback that way is because the uh, Sometimes we might accidentally put net sales instead of net income or, or have it reversed. So, so that's why the feedback would show the formula and then the, um, the, resp the correct response. I hope that helps answer your question. Not really, because basically, like what I'm asking is so, because I noticed that some other ones didn't give feedback. So what I'm asking is like, because, okay, so for this one, it would give you the feedback regardless, but did you just not set it up for some or like, because sometimes it would give the feedback for ones that I put right. So it made me think that maybe it was saying I put it wrong. So that's what I was asking about. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so so uh, so the feedback is automated. It's, uh, through, you know, through the book. That's why it says automated feedback. Um, uh, so, so basically it just shows you the, it shows you the formula and then it tells you why you got it right or why you got it wrong. So that, that's, um, that's kind of how that, that works. I, I, I don't have a, a better response for you because, um, I, it's, I mean, that's the question you're asking, right? It's about, it's about the feedback. And, uh, so the, the feedback of, with respect to the questions are, are automated. And so the textbook publishers writes the, these feedback components. Um, and so so essentially, if you got it right, it shows you why you got it right. If you got it wrong, it, sh it says, this is how you find the right response. Formula and then the numbers. Uh, Makia. Hey, Professor. Um I wanted to ask, and hopefully, I don't know if anybody was able to ask this question because I came in a little late. But go for it. Um, and I hope this um it covers the um. Basically, let me get into the question. So the question is, I didn't do so good on my midterms. Right. 
And um, is there any way, can we have um, a redo, the ones who was able to do it on time, can we um, have a redo if we didn't like our grade, like at least a, septi- a second attempt? No, there's definitely no second attempts on midterms or finals, only on quizzes and homework. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I cannot allow a second attempt on a midterm. Uh, that's that's just not going to happen. Um, but but if you haven't, Makia, have you taken the mid-ter- mid-semester survey? I did, right afterwards. Okay, well, if you, if you wait some time, because it's not due until the 9th, so after the after the ninth hits, I will uh, add the five extra bonus points to your grade. So, hopefully that'll help. Thank you, thank you, right. Professor. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, any other questions before we start our discussion on uh, constru- on receivables? I know that midterm exam brutal, but. Uh, I got some. I got some other good news. In addition, please again, I, I can't emphasize enough. Please take the mid-semester survey. It's free. Five extra points as long as you answer all five questions. So, uh, do it. <laughs> yeah, um, it can only help, right? So, uh, please uh, complete that by the ninth, which is um, Wednesday. Uh, by Wednesday night, please please com- complete that for me. Uh, and I will add those five extra bonus points to your midterm grade. Uh, that will help you. It helps me. Uh, it's a win-win, as they say. Uh, in addition to that, one, one other piece of good news. When I, we're not there yet, but when you know, after weeks five, six, seven, and eight, at the end of the course, when you go to take that midterm, that, I'm sorry, that final exam. The final exam, uh, it's a lot more straightforward than the midterm is. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, it's a little easier. It's more definition-based than mathematics. So a lot less formula on the, on the final. It's, it's more definition-based on the final exam. So hopefully that's a, something to look forward to. It is. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Ms. Edwards. It really is. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, my friends, let's go ahead and jump uh, into today's discussion on uh, on accounts receivable and uh, other receivables. <clears throat> so, in business, we uh, we sell things. <laughs> we sell things. We sell things for both either cash receipts or we sell on what we call on account. When I sell something on account, it means that I have delivered the goods or the service to the customer, but they have not yet paid me. That's called an account receivable. So if I sell you something and you don't pay me just right away, it generates what we call an account receivable. It means you're going to pay me in the future, right? That's what account receivable means to the company. I am expecting to receive that payment. Uh, The same can be said with anything else that the company is owed. When someone owes the company money, it's an asset for the company because I expect to receive whatever that is. So if I, if I, let's say, for example, I, the company, lend you, Zach, money, okay? I'm giving you a loan. The company is giving you a loan. That is what we call a notes receivable to the company. It's a loan due back to the company. You owe the company money. The company sees that as a receivable. And if it's a loan that you owe, it's called a notes receivable. And we'll talk about that in in a lot more detail. so we'll talk about the different kinds of receivables. Talk, we'll go into a little bit more detail on accounts receivable, notes receivable, uh, cash conversions. Uh, I'll, t- I'll talk briefly about bonds receivable. That's a that's a different type of concept, but similar to notes. Uh, talk up, and we'll also talk about 
What happens when our customers don't pay us? <laughs> that's, that's something no business likes, but it's something that we have to, we have to know how to write off. Because uh, if a customer owes you money and you can't collect it, then we have to write it off. And uh, there's a way of do there's proper ways of doing that. And so we'll, we'll talk a lot about that as well. So accounts receivable. <clears throat> okay. An account receivable is generated any time that a customer owes the company money. Uh, debt is what we call an accounts receivable. I've delivered the good or the service. The customer has not yet paid me. So therefore, it is a, an account receivable. Or, I've sold something on account. When you hear the word on account, it means account receivable. So, uh, it, we value our accounts receivable based on the percentage of total assets. This is how we, we call this valuing accounts receivable. We track our customers individually. Remember when we talked about um, this thing called subsidiary ledgers? Remember that conversation? I think, I'm pretty sure we talked about it last week. And we talked about this thing called subsidiary ledgers. It's the detail inside the general ledger, right? So um, you know how like it, with accounts payable, you know, those are the bills we owe. I have the individual people that I owe the money to. I got the electric company. I got my vendor one, vendor two, vendor three. I got my uh, uh, wages, uh, you know, the various, various reasons for why we owe money. We track our receivables the same way. Like I have different customers, okay? And these different customers owe the company money. So I, have, I, I track each customer account separately. But when I add them all up, it equals the total account receivable. See what I'm saying? So think of like each customer account as a subsidiary account to accounts receivable, which is the general ledger account. And uh, our subsidiary account shows the detail, right? It shows how much each customer owes me. How much they've already paid and all that. That's, we, we track it through that, that concept. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, accounts receivable and what happens when we sell something on account. This should, prob this should look a little f uh, familiar to you because... Uh, we went through these kinds of exercises when we talked about, way back when, when we talked about making journal entries. Uh, that was the chapter two thereabouts. So let's take a look at this example. We have a, a, one of our customers. Uh, we sold $950 worth of stuff to them on credit which is accounts receivable. Uh, and we also received some cash from a different customer from a different sale that we made to them previously. So in other words, that uh, the RDA Electronics customer, they're paying us from a previous sale that we made. So July 1st was a busy day for us. I made a sale uh, on credit or accounts receivable and uh, I'm also receiving cash from a different customer from a previous sale that I had made. So the first transaction is I sold something on account. So I debit accounts receivable, and then you see this little dash, and then it says comp store. That's my individual customer. So it's so important that we... Uh, Make sure that uh, the account receivable belongs to the specific customer because that's how we track how much that individual customer owes us. So debit, accounts receivable, customer name, 950 bucks. Credit, 
sales, 950. Remember, we credit sales to increase sales. And we debit our asset account, which is accounts receivable, to increase accounts receivable. And also on July 1st, I had a different customer, totally different customer, RDA Electronics. They're paying us what they owe us from a previous sale. So I debit cash 720 to increase my cash. And I credit accounts receivable for RDA Electronics, a different customer, to reduce the accounts receivable. That reduces the amount that they owe us because they're paying us, right? So debit cash, 720, credit account receivable, 720. And this shows us the effect on the, on the general ledger and the subsidiary ledger accounts. So we see on the general ledger, uh, it went up 950, down 720. That's just general account receivables. That's just the running total, right? But if we, we look at the detail, we see the receivables ledgers for our two customers. That's the subsidiary accounts. We see uh, RD Electronics, they um, they paid us the 720 so that it reduced uh, for them. Th their balance reduced. And for the uh, comp, comp store, their balance increased because they purchased from us on credit. This just kind of shows you what the, what that looks like in the effect on the uh, ledgers. So, uh, November 1st rolls around. Looks like I, I sold uh, some stuff on... Um, our store card. Okay, this is a little different. This is a little different. Works the same way, but it's a little different. Store cards are different than credit cards. Store cards are different than credit cards. We think of them as the same. The, the consumer does, but they're different. For example, my Macy's card is different than my Visa card. Uh, credit card through a bank. It's different. Yeah, it's very different. I can't go to, to um, Best Buy and use my Macy's card. That don't work. It only works at Macy's. Okay? I can't go to Macy's with my Best Buy card. It only works at Best Buy. Okay. That's what we call it a store card. It's called a store credit card, and it only works at that store. You can't go to a different store and try to use it because that ain't going to work. You can't, go, you can't go with your Macy's card over to Best Buy. It would be pretty funny if you tried it. They will probably laugh and say, this doesn't work here. It only works at Macy's. I mean, that would be funny to try that, right? I might, I'm thinking about doing it later. That would be hilarious. Yeah, we had that same situation at, uh, at Petco, Professor. <laughs> So well, can I use this, this this pet smart card? And we're like, <laughs> I just give them a look like no, no, we're not the same. We seem the same, but we're different. <clears throat> right on, Mike. Yeah, that, that's an excellent example. So so let's say it's Petco. Okay, this this is this will fit for the example purposes, and it's applicable. So that way you'll understand it. Okay, so uh, November first, Petco recorded some sales from a one of their customers that used the Petco card to purchase a thousand dollars worth of pet stuff okay so november 1st petco records this transaction they debit accounts receivable a thousand dollars and they credit sales a thousand dollars to record the sales made on the petco store credit card <clears throat> now here we go two months later at the end of the year now, this is an adjusting entry that we're doing at the end of the year. December 31, Petco recorded an adjusting entry for interest. Interest, as you know, is what consumers pay for the privilege 
of borrowing using a credit card. For those of you who have ever used a credit card in your life, you have probably had to pay this thing called interest. Interest is what we pay to the bank or to the store, in this case, for the privilege of purchasing merchandise on credit. Because remember, credit is a form of debt. Yeah, credit is a form of debt. A, a credit card works is very similar to a loan. It's money you have to pay back with interest. So it works the same way. On the store side of things, they're collecting interest on the sales that they make from their store credit card. So when, when, when you use the store credit card, let's say you go to Petco and you swipe the Petco credit card at the checkout, of course you owe them what you purchased, but you'll probably have to pay interest, especially if you pay it later. So... What Petco does is they'll record the interest as a adjusting journal entry at the end of the month. So on December 31, Petco recorded the accrual of interest. Accrual means that we're accruing interest that is owed to us. Yeah. So, to do this, we look at the interest rate, in this case 1.5% per month. That's pretty low, by the way. In real life, it's probably like 27%, but I'm just saying. 1.5% per month on the, store, on, the, on the store card. So, since they purchased $1,000 worth of stuff, 1.5% of $1,000 is $15. So, the adjusting entry goes like this. I debit accounts receivable, $15, to increase the account receivable for this customer. And I credit interest revenue, $15. It's not sales, it's interest revenue. It's a different kind of revenue. Sales revenue is revenue we earn just from the sales. It's like the principal balance, yeah? That's just sales. That's sales revenue. Interest revenue is the revenue we earn from interest from the use of something like a store card or a loan that we issued, yeah? So, in, so we debit accounts receivable to increase accounts receivable because eventually that customer is going to pay us the thousand plus the fifteen, and we uh, and so for that second transaction we're crediting interest revenue to increase interest revenue. We're recognizing our interest revenue. Make sense so far? Y'all good, right? Yes, it makes sense. All right, cool. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Now, here we go. Here's, an, here's another fun one. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let's say we're Petco. We're Petco, okay? So, every time a customer uses a credit card, sometimes even a debit card, Depends on the agreement. But let's say it's a credit card, okay? Let's say you have a customer. They come to your, your store. They swipe the credit card. Uh, don't get me wrong. Credit cards, for the store, it's good. For, not for the consumer. For the store, customer swipes the credit card. The store has to pay a fee for accepting the credit card. We call this a credit card processing fee. Okay. 
The store has to pay that, not the customer. The store does. So every time a customer swipes that card, the store has to pay a percentage of the sale. Yeah, that sucks, right? <laughs> it sucks. You got to pay a percentage of the of of the sale. On average, it's about four percent. So if you use a Visa, or if your store, if your store Petco accepts Visa, Mastercard, American Express, whatever, Discover, I don't know. Whatever you're accepting, you have to pay the credit card processing company, the company that does the machines, yeah, processes the transaction for you. You got to pay them. On average, you got to pay 4%. As of right now, this has probably changed a little bit. When I had my business, it was 4%. I had to pay 4% for Visa and MasterCard and Discover. For American Express, it was 7%. Okay. That's why some places, you'll see, they'll, it'll, it'll, they'll even say at the register, we do not accept American Express. That's the reason why. Because the store has to pay an additional percentage for certain types of cards. So, yeah, I know, right? It's not it's not exactly the most fair system, but they don't make the, the stores don't get that. We don't make these numbers up, right? This is what's dictated by the credit card companies. Okay, so in this example, our company, uh, Petco, we made a a, a sale of a hundred bucks on credit. Uh, and so there's a 4% fee involved here. So what happens is we receive, the store receives $96 from the sale, and we have to pay $4 for the credit card expense. So we debits, uh, we... We debit cash, $96. We debit credit card expense, $4. And we credit sales, 100 We see that the debits and credits equal, right? 96 plus 4 is 100 Sales, 100 This represents the actual cash we receive and the credit card amount that comes out automatically. And this is reality. Every time that a credit card gets swiped at a store, it looks it's very similar to this. Questions? It makes sense, right? It sucks for the retailer and for the customer who has to pay the interest. <laughs> I know. Stay away from credit card debt. It's bad. Okay. Sometimes, uh. You might purchase something, and they'll say, oh, you can pay for that over time. <laughs> I'm not a, you can tell I'm not a fan of this part. So let's say uh, uh, you, you want the Best Buy. Uh, yeah, you want the Best Buy. Oh, that's right. The Super Bowl is next weekend, right? So, okay, so you want the Best Buy. And you, you know, you're all excited about the big game. And so uh, you want to get a big TV for the big game. And they have a special. The special is, oh, uh, you buy this 80-inch TV. I don't even know how big TVs are now. Let's say it's 80. You buy this 80-inch TV uh, from Best Buy. And you can make four equal payments of... $500 over four months. It's, we call that sales on installment. The customer pays over time, usually over an extended period of time, and is, charged, is usually charged interest. We call that sales on installment. 
So like when you, when you go to sign the agreement, it says, oh, I, I agree to pay four equal installments of this amount over time. Yeah, that's called sales on installment. I'm not a big fan of that either because of the whole interest part, yeah? From a consumer perspective, I don't like that. From a business perspective, it's great. Professor, yeah. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so when you do that, um, does it not usually help your credit? Like, uh, I know, your buying clothes score, your, and your stuff. Your personal credit score, your FICO thing or whatever they call it, yes. Um, it, yeah, it does. But as, as long as you make the payments on time every time, don't ever be late. All right. <laughs> okay. So it does have its benefits, though. Uh, yeah, it depends. It depends what your long-term goals are. You know, sometimes people want to build a credit score to be able to get a, a good interest rate when they buy a house or a car. Those are the only reasons why you want a good interest rate. Otherwise, I try to stay away from debt at all costs. The reason why is because indebtedness causes stress. It causes money problems down the road. It causes a lot of other issues. So just be very careful when you are using credit cards or other forms of debt because it has negative long-term social economic impacts on individuals. Yeah, so... Just something to think about. So when you when you Makia, when you when you're thinking about like buying a house or buying a car, you don't always have to go that route. One thing you could always do is what we call manual underwriting. What that is is uh, the banks will look at your income and your expenses, and they won't 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 look at your credit as a factor. But you have to usually have to perform a couple of years worth of uh, supporting documents. Something to think about. You're very welcome. Now, sometimes, oh, sometimes customers don't pay us. I don't like that when customers don't pay me. You know, if it was, if I was back in New York and a customer didn't pay me, I'd probably pay them a visit. But you know, these days you're not supposed to do that type of thing. So, we do this thing called the direct write-off method. Professor B is a leg breaker. I'm uh, sorry. I'm sorry, Mike. Go ahead. No, you as a leg breaker be funny. <laughs> hey, you know, the, that that Louisville slugger goes a long way. So, uh, okay. So, so you these days you cannot collect using Louisville slugger. So, uh, in business, we have this thing called a direct write-off method. The direct write-off method uh, is used sometimes when a customer doesn't pay. We refer to uncollectible amounts as bad debt expense. Okay. Sorry. Here's how it works. Uh, with our, uh, accounts receivable, we have what's called an aging report. An aging report shows us how long their account has been in an accounts receivable, okay? Uh, usually the way it works is a current account is zero to 30 days. Zero to 30 days means it's current. It means that, hey, you know, they just, they just uh, purchased this on credit. Uh, they'll probably pay us back within 30 days. That's zero to 30. That's what we call credit, uh, um, current, current, sorry. That means it's a it's a current accounts receivable, and uh, I can I can collect I expect to collect that within thirty days. If it reaches thirty one to ninety days, that means they're a little they're running a little late paying paying that accounts receivable back to the store. That becomes problematic because when it reaches thirty one to ninety days, that means the customer is now past due. That's when you receive your first written notice, right? Hey, you're past due. Uh, you know, pay me now. Otherwise, I should send Jimmy to your house. And uh, so then, right, then they, uh, if they don't pay you 31 to 60, 61 days rolls around. 
61 to 90. Okay, 61 to 90 is the next bracket. And uh, that's they're really late at this point. They've received their second notice by now. Yeah. Second notice, you know, next step is I send you about the collections. You know, that's usually what happens. So, okay, uh, so then 61 to 90 rolls. 91 to 180 is that last classification. 91 to 180, 91 days to 180 days. Uh, you know, at that point, I would send it to collections. And the, as a company, what I would do is I would write off that debt to the company as a bad debt expense because I'm not expecting someone to pay that late. Most company the, the the chances of you collecting an account receivable that old, very slim. Very, very slim. Like zero to thirty, I would expect to be able to collect that um, you know, ninety percent of the time. Ninety percent of zero to thirty, that's collectible. You'll be able to get the, the money from the customer zero to thirty. Thirty one to sixty, uh it's it, the statistics get a little worse. You know, it's like I might be able to collect maybe 50% of that. 61 to 90, you might be able to collect maybe 25% of that. 91 to 180, uh, good luck. I mean, that's probably like 5%, maybe. And then anything older than that, it's pretty low. Professor, I have a question. Yes, please. Yes, sir. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Well, are people, would well, they pay more when they like get the deal? They offer them a, a lower payment just to get rid of it and they offer them a lower. How often does that work? They offer you like just, you pay two thirds of it or half of it and we'll, we'll just let it go like that. How does that work out? So you mean you, you so oh, so good. That's a great question, Miss Edwards, and and I'm actually going to talk about that uh, as well here in the near future through the allowance method. But um, before we get to that, Miss Edwards, uh, to address your question, there are two opportunities to be able to collect something, okay? Because <laughs> sometimes you know you work a deal with your customer. Most time we send it to collections. Once the company sends something to collections what they're doing is they're selling that debt to a debt collector that's what collections means it's with a different company they try to collect it on behalf of the company that's not really true i mean it is to some degree but it's really not what that when something goes to collections what that means is the company that you originally had the debt with they sold that debt for pennies on the dollar to a debt collection agency. That agency will then try to track that customer down and collect payment. But that payment goes right to that agency. It does not go to the actual um, original vendor. So that's one method, uh, Ms. Edwards, is that the, the, the store will sell the debt. I have a question. I have a question to, to, to that make that statement to what you just said. Yes, ma'am. Because I always thought it was to say, okay, and so when the company sells it over to a credit agency, hmm. the company washes their hands, everybody have no more to do with it. It's the credit. Okay, my question to to that to that is I've heard the same people say, Well, they were the credit people on the phone, they act like it's their money. Well, I didn't know that it really is. Because it is. Yeah. <laughs> it is at that time, yeah. Yeah, that's that's one hundred percent right. Yep. So, so uh, the reason why companies does do that, Miss Edwards, is companies want to get some cash. You know, to the idea of just writing the whole thing off. Um, I'd rather have some cash than nothing. So, as a as a business owner, I might sell that receivable to a debt collection agency. That de debt collection agency will pay me. Uh, at Macy's, they'll pay me. Uh, the agency, they'll go after whatever's owed, and that's their money. That they ain't gonna give that money to back to Macy's. So that's one method. Well, I have a question about that. Please. Yes, uh, Asma. 
for the debt collection, they will pay you for the whole debt or just like percentage? Yeah. Because so, sometimes they negotiate the price, the amount due, and they will. It's normally it a percentage. Down. Yeah, it's normally a percentage. Uh, oh, so, okay. so typically the, the business, like Macy's, for example, and the debt collection agency will negotiate. And they'll say, hey, Macy's, I'll give you uh, 25% of um what that customer owes you and we're going to go after you know the customer great so may so so that collection agency pays macy's 25 percent of the of the collectible uh, uh the, the account receivable and um they'll go after the customer for the full amount and that but usually that they'll nego even negotiate with the with the customer assuming that they can find them yeah. Yeah. Uh, and okay. then but that's usually how it works. Good, great question. Absolutely. And, and there's a couple of other methods. And the other method to collection is called allowance. And that's that's um, where we convert the account receivable into an account, um, a note receivable. And we'll talk about that. So to write it off, uh, let's say, you know, hey, you know, this customer fell off the face of the planet, can't find the guy. He owes me 520 bucks. Uh, there's just no way. He rolled into 91 plus days um, out, and I, I just can't collect. Yeah, that happens. So what the business does is we're going to write off the bad debt, uh, the, the account receivable as what we call a bad debt expense to reduce the account receivable. And we're increasing an expense line called bad debt expense. So what we do is we debit bad debt expense and credit the account receivable for that customer, 520 bucks. This does one, th this, there's a benefit for the, for the company to do this. When a company writes off a, an account receivable as bad debt expense, what happens here is that now I, the business, I can write that off my taxes. I'm reducing my net, my net income by doing this because I'm increasing my uh, expenses. And by doing that, uh, I am reducing my tax liability based off of my net income. So that's why, that's why we call it writing it off. It's, it's a, it's a method of writing it off through, through taxation, essentially. Uh, so that's, that's why that, that term came about. And so we noted to that specific customer, reduce that customer's receivable because they're not going to pay us. We debt, bad debt expense to increase the bad debt. Let's say uh, this happens once in a while. So here we are several months later. The customer comes out of the woodwork. Okay. All of a sudden he's back from the dead and he's like, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I forgot that I owed you that money from several months ago. Hey, that happens, right? I mean, it's nice when that happens. You know, customer just woke up one day. Oh, my goodness, I owe you money. It's like, <laughs> haven't seen you in a while, Jay Kent. It's been, it's been a minute. Okay, so we need to adjust Jay Kent's account receivable because I already wrote it off. But the good news is it happened in the same year, so I can make an adjusting entry. Or in this case, a reversing entry. So what I do is I reverse the previous entry. I debit account receivable to get it back up, and I credit bad debt expense to reduce that bad debt expense. It's called a reversing entry. A reversing entry. I'm reversing that previous transaction. Remember, in accounting, we cannot just delete transactions. No, never do that. You can't delete a transaction. That will screw your accounting records up major. Okay, don't do that. You never delete a transaction. And if you need to make a correction to a previous tra uh, journal entry, like we did with the bad debt expense account receivable, you just do what we call a reversing entry. Don't delete it, just do a reversing entry. So in this case, we're doing a reverse entry debit account receivable, credit bad debt expense to reverse that previous transaction. Now, uh, the, on the same day, customer's paying us, 
in full. So I debit cash because I got cash in and I credit account receivable to reduce the receivable. Never delete a transaction. Always just make a reversing entry if you need to or an adjusting entry if you need to. I can't tell you how many times I, I've done consulting work with small businesses and they, uh, I, I'm looking through like their QuickBooks uh, file or their, you know, their accounting records. And I look and I see that they deleted a transaction. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> you can't do that. And the other reason too is like if that customer ever gets, if that client ever gets audited by the IRS, oh, that's bad news bears you know, all day. Asma, yes, please. So sometimes when you do double entries, you can delete it because I remember before I work when I like they should, delete some entries when you, they do double. You have the ability to delete it, but you should never actually delete it because what that you does adjust it. just do reversing entry or an adjusting entry. Yeah, yeah, oh. you don't want to actually delete it because what what ha what happens, Asma, is it it actually does two things. Number one, it'll throw a red flag in your system because uh, every keystroke is recorded, right? So like, like in, a, in a QuickBooks or in like uh, some type of accounting software, every time you hit a key, it gets recorded. It records everything you do, right, on the keyboard. So when you delete a transaction, that gets recorded that you deleted it in a separate report that only a, the administrator knows about, and it's called um, a Remove Transactions Report, and it shows all the deleted transactions. So just be very, very careful when you're when you're using accounting software that you're not actually deleting transactions. If you make an error, just do a reversing entry, or do a um, uh, reversing entry, or do a um, adjusting entry when you need to. Great question. And What's Professor, I actually had a coworker um, of mine when I actually worked in the finance department. She actually got fired for oh, sure. deleting a transaction because she double entered it. And they looked at it as a form of as if she was making fraud. Fraud. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and they fired her for that. And yep. she had and she, and it was a clear mistake. And she had deleted yep. like most, she was deleting entries before, but everything reconciled, but she may have just double entered something and she deleted it and they took that as fraud. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen that happen too. Uh, in fact, I've yeah. had, to, I've had to fire people for that reason as well. Uh, it's a very, very serious violation to, to delete, uh, any transaction really. It's it, there. And the reason Shanae is because like, if we, if we look at previous cases, like for example, um, uh, publicly traded companies, right? Like ones that have committed fraud in the past. Not not just Enron, but there's so many other companies out there that committed these frauds. And one of the one of the uh, primary themes with with fraudulent um, things going on is deleting transactions. Uh, you know, reducing their expenses, if you will, by deleting transactions. And uh, um, even if it's a mistake. You know, you get in a lot of trouble from the IRS or from, uh, you know, some type of auditing party. And so, yeah, it's unfortunate that that happens. But that's why it, every time I teach this course or any other course related to it is never delete a transaction. It's just you don't want that. That's yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's uh, interesting. Uh, Makia, TurboTax. TurboTax is a tax software. So, um if you're using TurboTax and you're helping other people with their taxes, um, the only time you would get in trouble with something like that is if uh, you did it after the filing was done. Uh, that could be problematic because the IRS could audit and that would be a problem. TurboTax does not necessarily record every keystroke, um, but they do track certain things like that. And it, like, so if there's an adjustment after the filing was done, then, yeah, that would be a problem, especially if you did it for someone else. But the, uh, with TurboTax, it's usually the only time something like that happens if, is if you're filing taxes for someone else 
and you've deleted a transaction or uh, some type of thing on a form. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just be very, very careful every time you're using those types of software. So with, with direct write-off, uh, of course, we need to match things, right? So, so if, I'm, if I'm writing off a um, receivable, it needs to match the time period that the sale happened in. So I need to make sure that my adjusting entry is in the same accounting period. So in that last example with Jay Kent, like if Jay Kent didn't show up out of the dead and pay us, then uh, that write-off would need to occur in the same year as the sale. Um, in December, it gets a little tricky because in December, there's the, the, the sales that you make in December, they're still current, right? Um, but if we go into the next fiscal year, then uh, we would need to make a special journal entry. I think it's a little tricky. But the, uh, the accounting recognition principle tells, uh, the, the um, expense recognition principle tells us we have to record those types of adjustments in the same accounting period. Uh, otherwise, it becomes an allowance, and we'll talk a little bit about that here shortly. So let's talk about the allowance method. <clears throat> Allowances. Sometimes the bad debt expense that gets recorded uh, is direct, right? The direct method tells us that we are simply writing off that account receivable for that customer. Companies also have the ability to estimate how much they probably won't get paid back over time. We call this an allowance method. It's a little tricky but uh, I'll show you how it works. With an allowance method, the company, what they do is they take all of their accounts receivable and we estimate how much we're not going to be able to collect. We call this an estimate for the allowance of doubtful accounts. And the estimate for the allowance of doubtful accounts is an estimate of how much we think we're not going to be able to collect. Typically, what I do in, in real life is I look at um, my aging report that I told you about earlier. The aging report shows you how long it's been in an accounts receivable. 0 to 30, 31 to 60, 61 to 90, 91 to 180. 181 plus, right? Uh, 181 to 365 usually. So what that does is it shows us how many days it's been in accounts receivable that the aging report does for each customer, yeah? And so what I do is I, uh, I factor the uh, percentage that I'm not going to be able to collect for each uh, time period that as it gets older, yeah? And uh, I factor an, uh, an allowance, an estimate. And the estimate is a percentage of sales that I'm not going to be able to collect from my customers. And it's usually pretty low. It might be like uh, 5%, 2%, 1%, whatever. Uh, it's, an est it's simply an estimate based off of what we expect we won't be able to collect from our customers over time. That's what the allowance method is. So two advantages to it. We're estimating how much we won't be able to collect over time. And we're reporting the account receivable on the balance sheet at, at the estimated amount that we collect. Here's how it works. Here's, an, here's a nice example of it. Our company. Uh, let's say we're, um, we're Petco, okay? Petco, uh, we made $300,000 of credit card sales, store credit card sales. You know, the Petco card. We made $300,000 in Petco store card sales 
during the first year of business. Okay. So Petco's brand new. Let's say it's just for our store. It's not for the whole company. At the end of the first year, $20,000 of those sales remained uncollected. So quite a few customers have not yet paid us back throughout that first year. Based on this experience and the experience of similar businesses, our company, Petco, estimates that $1,500 of my account receivable is probably not going to be collected. In other words, that small percentage of customers is going to disappear. (laughs) They're not going to ever pay us. So, to record this estimate, we debit bad debt expense, and we credit this account called the allowance for doubtful accounts. The allowance for doubtful accounts simply means it's an estimate. It's an estimated amount of bad debt, meaning this we estimate that this amount is not going to pay us back. Makes sense? Y'all still good, yeah? Y'all good? Yeah, it makes sense. Good, I'll here. Okay, awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very good. Okay. So debit, bad debt, expense, credit, allowance for doubtful accounts. So remember, the word allowance. When you see the word allowance, think estimate. Our company, Petco, made $300,000 in credit card sales. Petco credit card sales. Store card during the first year. At the end of the first year, 20000 is still got to be collected. We estimated that 1500 will be uncollectible. That's very fair. It's a very fair assessment. Here's how it looks on the balance sheet. On the balance sheet, we see accounts receivable, 20000 We also see an account called allowance for doubtful accounts. The allowance for doubtful accounts is what we call a credit balance on our assets. Credit balance on our assets. Basically, it's a negative asset account. The allowance for doubtful accounts is a negative asset account. The allowance for doubtful accounts is a negative asset account. Negative asset account simply means that is what we call a contra account. It contradicts accounts receivable. So if something contradicts accounts receivable, it means that we're subtracting from accounts receivable. So allowance for uh, accounts receivable minus allowance for doubtful accounts gives us the amount of the current assets, 18,500. So so in other words, it gives us the uh, accounts receivable balance. So accounts receivable minus allowance for doubtful accounts equals accounts receivable net, 18,500. Oh, man, this guy, he still hasn't, he's not paying us again. This guy, Jay Kent. I don't know where this guy went, okay? He's gone again. So our company, Petco, determined this guy, he's not going to pay us. 520 bucks. So we debit, we estimate that he's not going to pay us. 520 bucks. So we debit allowance for doubtful accounts. 520 and we credit accounts receivable 520 to reduce this guy's account receivable. Unbelievable. He, you know, he still won't pay us. Guy's killing me. Okay. So we write, so um, let's say 
we realize that, uh, yeah, he ain't paying us. So here's the difference. Here's, here's the difference between what it would look like for write-off, what it looks like with uh, um, or before and after the write-off period. So account receivables, 20000 We estimated that we won't be able to collect 1500 So 20000 minus 1500 is 18500 That's net account receivable. After the write-off, we realized that, yeah, you know, uh, we weren't able to, uh, to uh, collect 980 of it. So that's like kind of like the, the estimate compared to the actual. Actual is after the write-off. Before the write-off is the estimate. Yeah. So uh, 19,480 accounts receivable. Because remember, I reduced Jay Kent's account receivable because he didn't, he didn't pay me. <laughs> and I also uh, reduced the allowance for doubtful accounts by that amount. And I got uh, 18500 not receivable. But then he woke up and decided to pay us in full. I, you know, if this were me, I would not have him as a customer anymore. But, you know, some businesses are silly like that. So, okay, so March 11th rolls around. He decides to pay us 520 so debit account receivable to re increase the receivable, credit the allowance for doubtful accounts to reduce the allowance. Debit cash, credit account receivable. These are the two transactions we make. To first one is to reverse the entry, and the second one is to represent the cash for receivable from the customer. But for me, I wouldn't sell to that guy anymore. All right, so bad debt expense. There's two ways we can uh, estimate bad debt expense. One is by what we call percent of sales method, which is the most common and the easiest method. So percent of sales method. It's simply a percentage of sales. And the second method is called the account receivable method, where we take it a percentage of accounts receivable and we use the aging report of accounts receivable remember the aging report i've been telling you about this where it comes in handy okay first the percentage of sales method very easy very easy computation we take uh current sales for the month for the year, whatever. Current sales times the bad debt percentage. Now, here's the thing. Bad debt percentage, that's determined by the company. It could be 0.5%, 1%, 5%, whatever. It's whatever the company determines that they're not going to be able to collect. It's an estimate. So sales times... Bad debt expense, or bad debt percentage. And that will give me the estimated bad debt expense. Very simple, very straightforward. So here's an example. Musicland, oh, that's cute. Okay, so Musicland, we uh, sold uh, $400,000 um, on our Musicland credit card. We estimate that we won't be able to collect 0.6% of our sales. So we take our sales, 400,000 times 0.6%, and we estimate that we will not be able to collect 2,400. So we debit, uh, this is an adjusting, uh, yeah, this is an, a, a, um, what we call a uh, adjusting journal entry. We Debit, at the, at the end of the year, debit, bad debt expense, 2400 
credit allowance for doubtful accounts, 2400 Remember, you hear that word allowance, think estimate. Allowance, estimate. So that's the first method. The second method is called the percent of receivables. Wait, is that what we're talking about the same thing? Uh, percent of sales. Okay. So first one was percent of sales. This one's called percent of receivables. So instead of using sales, obviously we're using receivables. So here's how we go through this one. If I'm using my percent of receivables, I take my account receivable balance at the end of the year. So December 31, whatever, or, or end of the fiscal year, account receivable balance times my bad debt percentage. We can compute this by taking the total estimated bad debt expense that we got from that first part. So first thing you do is take your account receivable balance at the end of the year times the bad debt percentage. So we take that amount minus the previous balance in the allowance for doubtful accounts. equals my current bad debt expense. So our company, Musicland, we have $50,000 in account receivable at the end of the year and $200 uh, credit balance and allowance for doubtful accounts from the previous year. So we take 5% of receivables are uncollectible. That's what we estimate we won't be able to collect. So I take 50,000 account receivable balance at the end of the year times 5%. That gives me 2,500. So uh, 2,500 won't be able to collect it minus the previous uh, balance of 200. It's me 2,300. So I debit bad debt expense, 2300 Credit, allowance for doubtful accounts, 2300 And that's how we get the percentage uh, from a percentage of receivables. And earlier I said we use uh, the, the, aging, uh, the aging report. The aging report tells me how long things have been past due. 0 to 30, 31 to 60, 61 to 90. 91 to 180, 181 plus. <laughs> it gets pretty old. So, uh, and this is this is a, a method that I prefer to use because it's the most accurate. And what we do is we apply a percentage of uh, uh, estimated percentage that we will not be able to collect based off of each aging group. So here's how it works. This is the aging report for our, our company, Musicland. Uh, so I have all my customers lined up on the, le on the left and all of their respective totals. Uh, zero, not due yet. One to 30, days past due. 31 to 60, 61 to 90, over 90. We can see the percentage of uncollectible estimated increasing over time. The older the account receivable gets, the less likely I'm going to collect it. That's just, you know, human nature, right? So what we do is we take our totals of, of, of receivables for each time classification or each time group, I should say. Not due yet, 37,000. I estimate I won't be able to collect 2% of that. 1 to 30 days past due, 6,500. 31 to 60, 3,700. 61 to 90, 1,900. Over 90, 900. I multiply that by the percentage that I estimate I won't be able to collect based off of each age group. And that you add all those together, and that gives you your total estimated uncollectible amount for that time frame, in this case for that year.
I like that one the best because it's usually it's usually the most accurate. So I determine the uh, current balance. Then I determine what the uh, account balance should be, and I make the adjusting entry from steps one and two. You all good? Comments, questions? Yes, sir. Would you go back to the previous slide? Yes. Sorry. Um, I see that there's a 40% right there. Yep, for, for over 90 days past due. Yeah, and so, so, yeah, and so that, what the percentage represents is what the percent of that total in the, over 90 days past due that I will not be able to collect. So what I'm saying here, Celine, is I don't think I'm going to receive 40% of what's owed to me when it's past 90 days past due. So in other words, the older the, collect the receivable account gets, the more likely it is that I'm not going to be able to collect on it. And so that's what that 40% is. It's an estimate of the amount that is in 90 days past due that I'm not going to be able to collect. Now, if it were me, if this were my business, that percentage would probably be a lot higher. <laughs> because when it gets 90 pa days past due, there's a very slim chance you're going to be able to collect that uh, on that receivable. Celine, does that help to clarify it for you? Yes, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Yep. Excellent. And so what you do is you take the total receivable and multiply it by the percent you expect you won't be able to collect. And that gives you your uh, estimated uncollectible for that time frame. And you add up all your time frames together to get your total estimated uncollectible. Excellent question. So then, of course, we go through these three steps to be able to come up with on the bad debt expense. So it's, it's just like what we did here, only it's just a visual representation, yeah? Okay, uh, the impact on your income statement balance sheet when you cannot collect a percentage of sales, it's going to impact your balance sheet, of course, uh, and your income statement. Because uh, on your income statement, we have sales minus expenses equals net income, right? So, of course, we, your expenses go up, bad debt expense, uh, which means your net income goes down. And on your income statement, or I'm sorry, on your balance sheet, it's based off a percentage of receivables, right? So, of course, that's going to affect your uh, uh, your assets. Now, sometimes uh, we get a situation where we work a deal out with our customer. We'll say, hey, customer, uh, we realized you're falling behind on your account receivable it, you know let's let's say this is that 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 guy jay kent right he felt he was like way far behind 90 days past due and we say hey we find the guy right we say hey uh how about this we're going to turn since you're having a hard time paying us we'll work a deal out with you we'll turn your account receivable into what we call a notes receivable. Basically, what we're doing is we're, we are converting uh, the account receivable into a loan. And so now, not only do you owe me the principal balance from the receivable, you also owe me interest. That's what we call a note receivable. Note receivable is basically a loan that the company issued to I uh, want their customer saying, hey, you owe me this receivable plus interest. Essentially, we're converting the receivable into a note, a loan. And so each note receivable has what we call a promissory note. 
It's the principal balance date the loan was created, when it's due, who it's due to, um, the percent interest rate, and that's signed by the company, by the customer. So just like with any other loan, a loan has what we call a maturity date. It's when the, the loan is due, when, it, when, when it's due in full. Okay, When a loan is due in full, the date is called a maturity date. It's the end of the life of the loan, essentially. Yeah? Maturity date, when's it, when it's due. So uh, we can figure out when the loan should be due based off of a couple of other dates. On July 10th, we received a $1,000 90-day 12% note as a result of a sale that we made earlier. And to figure out the maturity date, in other words, when the note is due, we look at a couple of factors. How many days are in July minus the date that note was issued? So 31 minus 1, so 21 days in July, plus 31 days in August, plus 30 days September. If the note is for 90 days, 21 plus 31 plus 30 plus 8, that means that the loan is due on October 8th. Basically, all you're doing is you're finding 90 days from the date it was issued. That's how you find the maturity date. Professor? Yes. Uh, uh, I have a, I have a question, just something that came to mind. Sure. Okay, like in February, mm -hmm. okay, if a loan is due, the maturity date is February the 29th but in that particular year is only year. 28 days in yeah. February. yeah so leap year yeah so when a leap year happens it rolls to the next month so and so instead of doing the t being due the 29th since 20 there are no 29 days every year it's only once yeah. every seven years so in that, in that case sense. it'll be due on march 1st that makes that makes sense. I do, but I just had to hear you say it. Thank it's, you. It's always ninety days. So if it's if you know if the twenty eighth happens or twenty ninth happens to be a leap year or whatever, it rolls to that next month. Yeah, good question. Happens every seven years, <laughs> or thereabouts, right? Okay. Uh, how do we compute interest, <clears throat> or how much interest are we going to get from the loan? To find how much interest you're going to get from the loan, we take the principal balance, or I'm sorry, the principal of the loan times the interest rate times time. Time is expressed in fractions of a year. If it's 90 days, that's how long the loan is, right? 90 days. If it's 90 days, we go 90 divided by 360 for the time. Now, I can already hear you, Dr. B, there's 365 days in a year, not 360. That's where you're wrong, my friend. There are 360 days in a banking year. Bank year. What do I mean by that? There are three every year. There are 360 banking days in a year. That's why we go 360, not 365. Now, you're, now you get it, right? 360. 360, not 365. Banking days. 360. So, $1,000 principal times interest, 12% times time. Time is expressed in fractions of a year. 90 over 360. So, principal, $1,000, times 0.12, 12%, times 0.25, which is fractions of the year, 90 divided by 360, equals $30 of interest that we would receive in addition to the note uh, principal.
got bankers rule, banking, banking days. There's only 360 banking days in a year. They recognize five federal holidays. That's why. Uh, no receivable. <clears throat> so I received my note receivable. Or I issue, I'm sorry, I issue the note receivable. When I issue the note receivable, the date, July 10th, debit note receivable, 1000 bucks. Credit sales, 1000 bucks. October 5 rolls around. Note due, or uh, 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 I'm sorry, I receive, I'm receiving a payment. This one, uh, this one's a different one. I'm, I apologize. This is a different example. October 5 rolls around. I got a customer who uh, I, I decided, hey, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to convert your, you know, this customer's always past due. So I said, hey, I'll help you out. I'm going to convert your account receivable into notes payable. So the customer says, hey, I'll pay you a portion of it, and I'll pay you the rest later. That's the deal I worked out with this customer. So I debit cash, credit note receivable. I'm sorry, debit cash, debit note receivable, and credit accounts receivable. What this does is I'm receiving cash on a, and a note to settle an account. Basically, the customer says, hey, you know, I don't have enough uh, cash to pay you up front. So I go, hey, I'm, I'll convert your account receivable to a note receivable, and you'll give me some cash now. Great idea. So that's what this type of journal on area would look like. It happens once in a while. It's it's rare, but it happens. You'll, you'll, you'll have a customer that'll pay part up front and then the rest later. <clears throat> Two words, honored and dishonored. Honored means that the customer fulfilled the note receivable on time. Honorable. Honorable. It means you paid it on time. Okay. When a note is honored, customer pays us on time. We debit cash, credit note receivable to reduce the receivable, and we credit interest revenue to recognize the interest that we received. When a note is dishonored, oh man, well, that note didn't work out, did it? <laughs> so I convert it back to an account receivable, but I add back in the interest. I'm still going to get that interest, even though this guy still didn't pay me. So I debit account receivable, increase the receivable. Credit interest revenue to recognize the interest revenue that I should have received, and I decrease the note receivable by crediting the note receivable. It's a dishonor, but they're still going to pay me that interest. Let me tell you. Well, there's this guy that didn't pay on time. At the end of the accounting period, I need to adjust for interest. Uh, so, at the end of the accounting period, I adjust for interest based off of the accrued interest amount. So, I debit interest receivable I mean, I expect to receive that interest in the future. And I credit interest revenue. It means I have accrued that interest. And I'll receive it later. Sometimes you got to make an adjusting entry, especially on a note that is at its maturity date. So uh, note that's at maturity, we debit cash. Credit interest revenue for the interest that you've received. Credit interest receivable for the interest you have not yet received. And we credit notes receivable to reduce the note by the principal amount. Sometimes we can convert a note receivable. Uh, to cash before they're due. So, in other words, like a customer pays us in advance or we're going to sell a receivable or we're going to uh, pledge a receivable. Here's how it works. Selling a receivable means that uh, this is where the, the business, we're selling 
our account receivable to a debt collector. Yeah. Earlier, earlier, I had said earlier in our discussion, I said, uh, so, you know, debt collectors, what they do is they purchase accounts receivable from businesses and then they go after whoever owed the debt originally. Right. The business receives cash, obviously, because I'm selling the account receivable to someone else. But I ain't getting all the cash that, that was owed, right? There's always a fee. We call it a factoring fee. So I debit the cash I received. I debit the factoring fee expense. That's the difference between the cash I got from the debt collector plus, uh, you know, it, and the difference. The difference is the factoring fee. Because you know... If the account receivable is worth twenty thousand, they're not going to give me the whole twenty thousand. They're going to give me a lot less than that, and that uh, they're going to go after whatever, right? That's now that's their receivable. So that that's what selling a receivable is. And then uh, pledging receivables, this is where uh, we use a note to secure a receivable. Uh, quick ratio, quick ratio. This one is called the account receivable turnover. Tells us how long the account receivable takes to collect. Okay. Uh, I take net sales divided by average accounts receivable. How do you find average accounts receivable? You take the beginning of the year accounts receivable plus the end of the year accounts receivable divided by two. That's how you find the average account. That, my friends, is the end of our discussion on accounts receivable. And uh, we'll, we'll jump into the next chapter here shortly. Uh, and I'll stop the recording here.